Food for Thought Productions is pleased to present Dr. Gerald LaRue, Professor of Religion and Archaeology at the University of Southern California. Free thinker, international lecturer, and author of 17 books, the most recent being Free Thought Across the Centuries. Here's Dr. LaRue speaking at the Ethical Culture Society of Los Angeles on the topic, The Shape of Things to Come. When you hear talks about uh, the shape of things to come, you're immediately reminded of, of prophetic statements. And I can recall uh, a friend of mine who was a clergy person talking in, in his church. He was very modern and very up to date. And one gentleman got up and said, you know, we've been told in the Bible that there are going to be false prophets, and by gum, we got one here among us right now, and he stomped out. So I have uh, a, a lot of caution when I approach a topic like this. I have no intent to prophesy. I want to simply observe and comment on what I think is obvious and perhaps what is not so obvious. And I'm going to begin with perhaps a negative factor. We are in the at the beginning of what is being called Millennium Fever. Uh, this is the beginning of a new millennium. And this comes out of, the idea of millennium comes out of the sacralization or the sacred nature of time that uh, has developed within Christianity. It was borrowed from Zoroastrian thought, but that's another issue to talk about. But the new changes in the calendaration have caught the imagination of many people. And so we have excitement. This is going to be the damnedest New Year party you ever had. And we have hotel reservations being made all over the place as part of the celebration. They're going to have a real wild party. We made it to the next century. Um, there are technological concerns. And that's the breakdown of communication. Banks are going to be affected and so on. Then we have the end of the age mythology. That is that Jesus is going to come riding back on clouds and pick up the, uh, the righteous and the rest of us, well, you know what will happen to us. There are ecological factors, and that is the destruction of our rainforests, the global warming, and the issues associated with uh, population control coupled with longevity. So we have all of these things that are part of the new millennium that we have to think our way through. That's number one, millennium fever. The second concern uh, with this period is what I call anti-intellectualism. And that is the attitude that is being fostered by some groups against the teaching of anything to do with the trigger word evolution in the public schools. There is also a reaction to what I would call rationalism in religion. I don't know whether you know, but the United Church of Canada right now is in a chaotic state because uh, the Reverend Phipps of Scarborough United Church in Calgary announced to his congregation, and by the way, he's the moderator or the head uh, of the United Church of Canada, which is the largest Protestant church there, and uh, he announced to his congregation that he no longer believes that Jesus was ever resurrected or that he ever went to heaven or that he was divine. He was a good guy, but none of these mythological factors. And the result is very interesting. There are, I've corresponded with some of my friends who are clergy up in there, and some of them say, at last, they breathe a sigh of relief. Somebody has conveyed to the general public and to the believing Christians what the seminaries have been teaching for years. On the other hand, there are those who call for the impeachment of the minister, get him out of what's he doing as moderator of the church and so on. So you have again this triggering of, of reaction. The other aspect of anti-intellectualism is the growth of fundamentalism. And uh, while we're being photographed here for use on television, the Trinity Broadcasting Network is increasing their outreach by I don't know what percentage every year. And the presentation that they make to the public is what has been called 
simply entertainment and you have people there that are breaking rocks with their heads and all this sort of thing in the name of Jesus and uh, to psychodrama where everybody gets involved and waves their hands and of course to them this sort of a meeting that we're having here is dull indeed. The third aspect that is concer that concerns me is the growth of giant corporations, the multi-corporations as they're called, which tend to diminish the significance of the individual. Capitation policies that are focusing on profit rather than service and the paying of MBAs from Harvard uh, five million plus benefits to head up HMOs uh, while the doctors if they're lucky get 150 to 200,000 or if they're specialists maybe 300 to 400,000 dollars a year. Uh, I must admit that the University of Irvine has come up with an answer to this. They're now giving a special MBA program for doctors only so they're going to get in on that cut too. But the growth of these patterns means the diminishing of the value and the significance of the individual. And there is a, the ethic of growth moves away from the ethic of meaning, which is what we're concerned with here. The other aspect of this is the loss, loss of the philosophical principle, ethical principle of authenticity. How can a doctor be true to his or her calling when under HMO guidance, capitation patterns, the emphasis is on cutting back the amount of service given. How can lawyers who are driven into the system in, with their concern for justice be true to themselves when the system itself is geared to prosecuting attorney who may suspect that the, in, the individual being prosecuted is innocent, but this is a good case, it makes a name for himself, and promotion is involved in this. So we're, we're, we're dealing with very basic ethical issues with the growth patterns that are here. Now, of course, the question is, what's this got to do with the Ethical Culture Society of Los Angeles? I am convinced of this, that Felix Adler, over a hundred years ago, developed an ethic which has to be modified as time goes on, that provides so far as I've been able to discover the best moral ethical guide for life and living that I've ever run across and I've studied I'm a historian of religions and I've studied these different patterns this man for some reason grasps something that was essential that's number one number two I think that we can extrapolate from this ethic moral and ethical guidelines for all the professions and all the businesses as well as for family life and individual life. I think that the essence of what it is to be a supreme human is involved in this pattern. And the third thing that troubles me most is I am convinced that we have failed the ideal. Not in our personal lives, but in our responsibility to make this ethic as widely known and as widely practical and as widely involved as possible. Our present American Ethical Union is talking about 10,000 more lives by the year 2000 and so on. That's a drop in the ocean. That's a drop in the ocean. Our outreach is too limited. Somehow our methodology is not reaching out and touching the numbers that it should. There was a time, for instance, when the New York Society had a radio program. And we've had people visiting us from different disciplines who said that they have listened to that. One uh, radio uh, uh, a television personality told us that when he came off the air he would go home at 11 o'clock get into a hot bath and turn on the ethical society's uh, message that's not done anymore the linking of the ethical movement with the university has has not been capitalized on, uh, on. Adler was a member of the faculty at Columbia University so were some of his key people all of these kind of special interests and special outreaches are no longer part of us. Meanwhile, the fundamentalist movement, the cons ultra conservative, ultra right religious movement has developed radio and television outreach that touches the lives of millions of people every day and brings in billions of dollars to augment that outreach. And they're right, they're, they're the result of their 
popularization of the ultra-right, ultra-conservative religion and the abandonment of rationality in the favor of entertainment, the ignoring of critical thinking, the insistence on blind belief in a document that's between 2,000 and 3,000 years old, counters everything that we stand for as a group of people who are committed to the highest ethic that we know. And I, again, I will say this, that for years the liberal churches, the liberal Christian churches, and the Jewish synagogue have practiced deceit from the pulpit. Clergy have been trained, and this is where I go back to what I said earlier about Phipps of Scarborough United Church in Canada. Clergy have been trained in the literary and historical analysis of biblical literature. They have not shared the information with their public, with their, with their parishioners. They know what is accurate and they know what is inaccurate. They tend to avoid the critical material and preach the platitudes. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The creation account in Genesis chapter 1 is not an original revealed Hebrew statement. The outline is borrowed from ancient Babylon. The process of creation that's given is not scientific. It's purely mythological. It has no relationship to science. It does not belong in our schools. And it has absolutely no relevance for today. How many times have you, would you hear that from the pulpit, in the synagogue, or in the church? The flood story which is being brought up again with creation science people, has no basis in geological science. It is a legend borrowed again from Babylon. It's nothing, nothing original in this material in the Bible. This is borrowed from outside people, and it has no place in our thinking today. The Christian notion of dead people being resurrected is borrowed from ancient Persia. We can show that came into Jewish thinking and was picked up by one sect of Judaism that became very popular, and that's the Christian sect. Biblical ethics. Oh, well, the doctrine of the millennium, by the way, is also borrowed from ancient Persia. That's a, their, another one of their concepts. Biblical ethics. Penned between two and 3,000 years ago. Completely out of date. Look at the Southern Baptists with their latest bit of dogma on women who should, what, submit gracefully to their husbands in a day when women are simply still trying to break through the glass ceiling in business and in professions. To equate, to, uh, to gain some sort of e equilibrium, or no, some sort of equality as of status in a male-dominated culture. Consider the Methodist church who's still wrestling with what to do with homosexuals. As though these people are taboo because the Bible says they are. And the list goes on and on and on. My point is this. Felix Adler was a man of his time. But his thinking was so open that it foreshadowed some of the dramatic social changes that have occurred during our modern era and in our modern society. He did not conceive of both husband and wife as wage, wage, wage earners. This is standard brand family today. Nor could he imagine the speed of communication that transfers knowledge and information, not only among ourselves, as telephones did in his day, but around the world on the web, as never before, creating a global community. His ethic is our heritage, and it's our responsibility to make it known and effective, not only by the ways in which we incorporate it in our own lives, that's essential, but in the ways we help that ethic to become universal. Now, what about the shape of things to come? What has my crystal ball told me? Well, first, the obvious. As the new millennium comes, we are going to face challenges and opportunities unlike those ever encountered before in human history. Already, those of us who are gray-haired and white-haired have lived through the most dramatic changes in human history of any generation 
before our time. We have compacted in our lifetime more changes than in any other period of history. And that's going to continue. The challenges that will be ahead of us will be global challenges. But they're going to impact on the individual. And I believe that ethical culture, societies, ethical culture leaders, ethical culture members, and I would say all humanists, all free thinkers, must grasp the opportunity to present this kind of an ethic. And I'm not asking for anything that I'm not prepared to be involved in myself. Some of you know that I have been active in global presentations. And I want you to know that wherever I go, the ethic of Adler is being presented. Sometimes openly, sometimes not openly. Uh, I use the printed word because that happens to be my way of reaching out. What we're getting today is something of the visual world also. But let me share some of the things I've been doing. Let me see if I can find my stuff here. Uh, this is a whole program that we've developed on. It's called Show and Tell that I'm going to share with you here. Um, some of you know I was in Korea. The Korea Times published a supplement and out of the some 200 lectures that were given on the back page of the supplement this appeared and if you can't read it it says no human being should be used as tool to su to satisfy the greed ambitions of others colon LaRue that's a direct quotation from Felix Adler and this item which I presented to a group of maybe 50, 60 people out of the several thousand that were there because we had groups meeting all over the place. This was the one, apart from the president's address, that appeared in press. I don't know why, but it was there. This means that I reached out in Seoul, in Seoul to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people with Adler's comment. And if you read this, and if you've read Adler, you will realize, listen to what I say at the end. I conclude with what I began. Humanistic global family values must be concerned with providing each family member with the means to become involved in meaningful work, employment, or efforts designed to promote the well-being of the entire human family, Adler. A meaningful life is more than mere existence. It involves purpose, direction, and a sense of belonging. Humanistic family values embrace individual rights to autonomy, dignity, free choice, liberty, fraternity, the pursuit of happiness and security, and so on. And then I end up with definitely Albert, uh, uh, Adler. For the world of the 21st century, humanistic values must project the vision of a world in which no man, no woman, or children shall live as servants or slaves existing simply to fulfill the whims and wishes and desires of others, a world in which no man or woman or child shall be used as a tool to satisfy the lusts or greed or ambitions of others, a world in which every human life, the life of every man, woman and child shall be a wanted, welcomed and esteemed member of the one human family. That's Adler. That's not LaRue. That's Adler. But now it's been published in a newspaper and it's being published in a wider volume called The World Encyclopedia of Peace. Let me see if I've got some other things here for show and tell. Um, yeah. This is the Kyung Hee University. It's one of my first visits there. And it has to do with the future. My title is called The Way of Ethical Humanism, A Guide for the Future. Again, my concern is that we reach out to the world. And in this also we have a, a, a presentation by a man named Howard Radist, who is also of the Ethical Culture Society. His is titled Reconstructing the Enlightenment Toward a Sociable Democracy. So we are reaching out. Here's another one. This one is from the world, from the, uh, how do they call themselves? The International Institute on Aging, the United Nations in Malta. And this is a paper I presented there, Eliminating Poverty in Old Age, How We Can Learn from One Another. Loaded 
with humanistic ethic. My concern is that we not only hit the things that here are close at home, but let, that we reach out to the nations. And in case you're wondering what I do at home, locally, this is from the Humanist Magazine, Science, Religion, and Public School Education. And again, the ethic is a humanistic ethic. Right down to this last book of mine, which my good friend Adolf Searchin was able to help me out on. Uh, page 130, a whole section on ethical culture. We're shooting this at the public schools. So, oh, the name of the book is called Free Thought Across the Centuries, and it has my picture on the front. Uh, now, I'm going to move into the prophetic mode. I know that when the millennium comes, I am convinced that when the millennium comes, Jesus will not come riding back on the clouds, the graves will not open, and dead people will not be resurrected. Christians are not going to suddenly disappear and go up to meet him. And I'm wondering what's going to happen when that religious fiction fails. If you listen to TBN, you'll find that Hal Lindsey, the great prophetic voice, is telling us that when the writer of the book of Revelations was describing some of the crazy creatures that he saw, he was really forecasting what was happening in our time, forecasting tanks and, and uh, missiles and all the rest of it. Life will go on as it did before the millennium, right after the millennium begins. And at that point, I think that humanistic groups and ethical culture should move into the forefront by admitting that we have absolutely no information of anything beyond this life. If there is an afterlife, we don't know it, despite von Prague's insistence that he's talking to dead people uh, and the spirits of dead people. What matters to us is an ethical life lived here and now, affecting our community and affecting our future the future of our communities. We do this without phony showmanship, without rituals, without program responses that uh, have you waving your eyes and arms and, and rolling your eyes and making sounds that make that are supposed to be uh, spiritually given. We do this with full respect for all people of all races, of all ages, of all sexes, of different sexual orientation, of all creeds, without, and all nationalities, without any barring or separation of one from the other. We have truly a universal ethic, and this is very unusual, very unique. Without this kind of outreach that we have in our hands, there are going to be young men and women graduating from our universities who don't know who they are, or what they are, or how to live their life. Those with critical thinking will have been led away from the mythology of the past, from the mythology of the temple, of the synagogue, of the mosque, of the church. And they will be looking for guidance to develop ethical stances that help them meet the conf and confront the issues of life and living that answer to them, why are you here if there is no afterlife? What is the meaning of your existence? In the university, people like myself will be educating young men and women in the sciences and in the history of human thought and philosophy. And they will ask questions, why has no one developed an organization that can respond to these questions that you're raising, where we can go and dialogue with others? And that's, they don't know about us because we have been silent about our presence. So I come back to the beginning. The shape of things to come. We will contribute to that shape by what we do and by what we fail to do. I am convinced that we have something very special to offer to the world to young men and women who are growing up in this world. We have that for which the world is hungry, and I think we have an obligation 
to let others know what it is and how it functions in society. Now, one of the things about the Ethical Culture Society is that there's no security in giving a talk. The usual pattern is we break for a few minutes and get some coffee and renew our energy, and then we put the speaker on the spot. In the church, it's much different. You go to the door and people say, enjoyed your sermon, enjoyed your sermon, whether they did or not. Uh, here, there's no such thing. But again, I say, this is where I'm at at this moment. And I've been at this ever since I discovered the ethical culture philosophy. I've been looking for this. I found some of it in humanism. But to have the statements as art articulated as clearly and as powerfully as Felix Adler did, and as summarized by our ethical culture statement. And again, I also published that in this little book. Let me read it to you as my conclusion. Some of you will be familiar with it, others might not. Ethical culture is a humanistic, religious, and educational movement inspired by the ideal that the supreme aim of human life is working to create a more humane society. Our faith is in the capacity and responsibility of human beings to act in their personal relationships and in the larger community to help create a better world. Our commitment is to the worth and dignity of the individual and to the treatment of each human being so as to bring out the best in him or her. Members join together in ethical societies to assist each other in developing ethical ideas and ideals, to celebrate life's joys and support one another through life's crises, to work together to improve our world and the world of our children. This is our challenge. Thank you. For more information about the Ethical Culture Society of Los Angeles, you can call them at area code 310-470-2873. You can obtain information about the national organization by writing to the Ethical Culture Union, number 2 West 64th Street, New York, New York, zip 10023, or call area code 212-873. 6500. This has been a Food for Thought presentation. We invite your comments and suggestions for future programs. You can reach us by phone or fax at 818-763-8567.